Is burning a holy book freedom of speech or a hate crime? The Swedish government says it is appalled by the act of an extreme right politician, but why was nothing done to stop Rasmus Paludan from burning the Quran? With the fallout spreading, we'll ask how serious the long-term consequences could be. I'm Andrea Sankey, and this is The Newsmakers. Well, the leader of Denmark's Stram Kors, or hardline party, has been convicted of racism and defamation before. The dual Swedish and Danish national had called for the deportation of all Muslims from Denmark, and on Saturday in Stockholm, under the protection of police, he was granted permission to hold a rally and burn a Quran outside the Turkish embassy. About 100 supporters joined Paludan. It wasn't the first time he organized a rally like this. In fact, Sweden had actually banned him from the country for two years in 2020 over a planned Quran burning in Malmo. But in October, he was granted Swedish citizenship due to his father's nationality. The Swedish government has tried to distance itself from Saturday's incident, with Foreign Minister Tobias Billström calling the Islamophobic provocations appalling. Sweden has a far-reaching freedom of expression, but it does not imply that the Swedish government or myself support the opinions expressed. Well, Rasmus Paludan's anti-Islamic rhetoric couldn't have come at a more sensitive time. It's inflamed tensions between Turkey and Sweden amid Stockholm's bid to join NATO. On Sunday, Turks went to pray at the Hagia Sophia Mosque in an act of solidarity with Muslims around the world. And in Istanbul, a protest was held outside the Swedish Consulate General. The Turkish government acted swiftly to condemn Sweden for allowing Paludan's Quran burning and postponed an upcoming visit by Sweden's defense minister. Turkey's foreign ministry also summoned Stockholm's ambassador to Ankara. It's the second time he's been summoned over Sweden's apathy toward Islamophobia. But Turkey isn't alone in its outrage. Condemnation has poured in from a number of world leaders. Among many others, the Moroccan foreign ministry warned in a statement, this hateful act, which offends the sensibilities of more than a billion Muslims, can fuel anger and hatred between religions and peoples. Pakistan termed the incident as a senseless and provocative Islamophobic act that hurts the religious sensitivities of over 1.5 billion Muslims around the world. In a statement, Bangladesh's foreign ministry condemned the act of insulting the sacred values of the Muslims all over the world in the guise of freedom of expression. Meanwhile, Azerbaijan's foreign ministry also condemned the burning of a copy of the Holy Quran in Sweden. We call on the Swedish government to bring perpetrators of this hate crime to justice soon. So should Rasmus Paludan have been denied permission for such an offensive gathering in the first place? And what could be the consequences of allowing it? Well, joining me now are from London, the spokesperson for the Muslim Public Affairs Committee UK, Ahmed Hussein. From Williamstown, Massachusetts, lecturer and researcher at the University of Salzburg and co-editor of the annual European Islamophobia Report, Farid Hafez. And also from London, Imam and broadcaster, Ajmal Masroor. Thanks all so much for being with us. Ahmed, I'll start with you. You know, Sweden continues to say, we don't agree with Paludan, but this is our sacred, protected freedom of speech. So help me understand, why was Sweden actually willing to ban him from the country when he was a Danish EU citizen wanting to burn the Quran, while as a Swedish citizen, they allow him to do exactly what they stopped him from doing before. So if you look at the response tweet by the uh, prime minister of the country, he actually says that he's sorry if anyone's been offended. Uh, he's not, you know, he's not condemning uh, the actions um, and he's not condemning even the idea of burning the Quran. He's just saying, oh, if you're offended, I'm sorry to hear that. And so it, that's not really a surprise because the right wing coalition that came into power last year um, the actions of Rasmus just plays straight into their hands. Um, Rasmus himself, he's a failed politician. Up mm -hmm. until 2019, he couldn't even get a seat, um, even based on his efforts with his Danish political party. So in 2020, he migrated to Sweden based on his, uh, his dad's uh, Swedish uh, ethnicity. And as soon as he's in there, um, again, he tries to stoke up um, social tensions. 
And in 2020, he manages to provoke a riot. In 2022, last year, he manages to provoke another riot. And basically, you have to just look at him as an individual. He's a failed politician. He has no relevance um, in Sweden's uh, political climate. He has no relevance in Sweden's society. So the only way, and, and you know, he's, he's uh, a beggar for attention, the only way he can get anyone's attention is by finding someone that he can provoke. And unfortunately, since 2022, he's, he's got the, he's uh, come in in a, in a political climate that works for him because now with a right-wing coalition and mm. a new uh, right-wing party in power, uh, they need, just like him, they need any kind of re uh, relevancy to remain legitimate because a new party, especially a right-wing party, can only come into power and remain in power if they can promise to their electorate that, hey, look, we're a new party, but we've got a new set of solutions for a new problem. Okay. So what do they need? They need a new scapegoat. So uh, just to be clear, you don't think their argument about this being about our sacred freedom of speech <laughs> is valid at all? You really think there's something more to the political objectives of yeah, the right-wing parties in power now that allowed him to do this? Yeah, I mean, the excuse of freedom of expression, well, what idea is being expressed? The the idea, the idea, only idea that's being expressed is that, hey, you Muslims, we want to alienate you. Mm. And he's deliberately going in front of a Turkish, the Turkish embassy because he knows that the, Turk, uh, the Turkish government is going to make uh, a, a loud reaction, and understandably, rightly so. Um, he's not going to go in front of you know, a, um, a a Muslim minority area, make his statement there. He's trying to be as provocative as possible. The last two times he tried, he went to residential areas, and yes, riots were provoked. He's trying to upscale. He's mm -hmm. trying to get, he is trying to get national responses. And yeah, now is just the right political climate for, to, for him to do so with the right-wing coalition in power. Okay. Uh, Farid, I mean, do you agree there? And also, what do you think really are, if there are political objectives at stake in this, what do you think this government's political objectives were, allowing him to do this, particularly at such a sensitive time, given what this government is I mean, after with NATO membership? I mean, yeah. I think on the one hand, you know, it's like the, we, we have the separation of powers, right? So it's not the government in the first place that allowed to, that to happen. Uh, it's the government that gives a reaction to what happened. Um, and I think, um, I mean, this is a trend that we see throughout Europe. Uh, whenever there is a center-right party in power, or in this case in Sweden, which is backed by the far right, you will also find some, come across some person that is going to try to challenge uh, those far right policies by being even more far right. Uh, and this is really what we are seeing here. I mean, I, I, I fully agree. Um, what just has been said in terms of, um, you know, it's a uh, quite irrelevant political person. But I think, again, I mean, in the larger picture, I think the problem here, really what is at stake, because, you know, as somebody who, um, who grew up in the German-speaking countries, the first thing really that comes to my mind if I see some kind of book burning yeah. is like uh, this, this very famous quote from Heinrich Heine, who said, those who burn books will in the end burn people. And, and I think we really have to look at this, uh, the symbol um, of this book burning. Um, the book burning symbolizes really some kind of, a, kind of a symbolic murder, a symbolic destruction. And this is actually exactly what the policy claims of this very unimportant and irrelevant politician is, which is like chasing Muslims out of the country, having zero immigration, et cetera, and trying to kind mm -hmm. of uh, uh, re rescue the white purity of the Swedish na national body. So I think the ideology, in terms of the ideology that is uh, is being uh, represented here, uh, this is something uh, when we see the, the 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 response by the, the Swedish government, that's not really the response. I think that really makes okay. sense uh, to give um, the Muslim minority a sense of security in their country. Right, Ajmal, let me ask you why. Is this not considered a hate crime? You know, it's almost like choosing to protect freedom of speech over protecting a person's right to feel safe. Because this is someone who is saying people, citizens, should be deported because of their religion. In every definition, this is a hate crime. I don't know who thinks it isn't a hate crime, except those who are trying to provoke and 
promote a self-serving policy, very right-wing, very fascist. Um, I am very uh, afraid of what's going on in Sweden. I have always thought Sweden was a very progressive, liberal, open-minded country, but the more it lurches to the right, the more I realize it isn't. Secondly, look, what is the real reason behind burning a book called the Quran? Because Quran is followed, revered, for, read, printed, memorized, and um, billions of Muslims uh, hold it to their, close to their heart. So if this person thinks he can eradicate the Quran by burning a simple book, of course they won't be able to. So it's not about eradicating the book itself. It's about alienating other in the Muslim community, further uh, creating the division within the Swedish society. We have people from Sweden who are often migrating to the UK of Somali background, of Iraqi background, of Syrian background because of extreme hostile right-wing environment that Sweden is slowly, slowly, but surely growing. These far-right gestures are definitely an indication of what's going on. And finally, look, this is unfortunate, but this guy, like uh, my previous contributors have said, is a failed politician. He's just desperate for attention. What the Swedish government should have done, just should have said this man is a definite hate crime preacher and we don't support him. I in mean, that, that's, uh, Al-Jamal, maybe you can understand better. I know you have some legal background as well. And that's why I asked initially about why they were willing to ban him from the country for two years, because he had proposed burning a Quran in, in Malmo. He was a Dutch, I mean, he was a, sorry, Danish EU citizen back then. Now he's a Swedish citizen. Only a slight difference there, to be honest with you. And now they allow him to do this act that they denied him just a few years ago. Why? It's, it's political right-wing posture, nothing else. It's just okay. des political gesture from the right-wing. Anything to create this division. You see, they are equating migration, immigrants, and Islam and the Muslims quite synonymously and interchangeably. They think all the immigrants are Muslims and all the Muslims are trouble. I have a challenge for both Swedish people, as well as those who are hell-bent on burning the Quran. Instead of burning the Quran, for God's sake, read it. If you read it, I bet you any money you will love it. But they're so afraid, they rather burn a book rather than engage, they rather burn a book rather than read. It's just a shallow, cowardly act of ignorance. Okay. And nothing else. Uh, you know, um, Ahmad, it, it's interesting because when we look at this individual, Rasmus Paludan, uh, Paludan, I have to really consider whether or not he thinks that profoundly about what he's actually doing. Because this is a man who has a list of legal complaints against him. He was hit with a five-year restraining order for stalking a young man. He had to answer to an investigation into inappropriate chats online with underage boys. This is not somebody who seems to be the most logical, to put it mildly, uh, of players out there. Yet, why does the government not take in consideration the type of person that is asking for this freedom to speak when they have this kind of actual criminal record behind them? Yeah, he's also had a brain injury, so I don't mm -hmm. want to insult him too harshly. Um, but it, uh, with anything in politics, it's about convenience. So here's a man who's willing to say and do things that the far-right party um, parties in coalition are no longer able to do because they want to maintain a sense of decorum now that they are in mainstream politics. They're not able to do what Rasmus is doing, but in terms of the concepts of their party, in terms of their Islamophobia, xenophobia, anti-migrant, um, pro, um, as, as someone said before, the, 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 the sort of mythological idea of a pure uh, Swedish or Nordic state kind of thing. He's able to do on the streets what they once would have acknowledged but can no longer do because they need to maintain a state of decorum. They don't want to scare away the centrist kind of voter base mm. and so on. So it is, it is purely political. And so because the problem is political, the solution must be political. We, we must not be, uh, you know, we got to be aware that we can't just be talking about Islamophobia as if it came out of nowhere and it's happening for no reason. Once we've identified the reasons, the motivations behind the key players behind it, it then helps give us the answer for how to resolve the situation. And, you know, there are um, political movements and parties like the Nyan's um, political party, which has been gaining um, political footholds across Sweden. Um, and, you know, I would say that that kind of work needs to continue. Mm -hmm. We need to be, um, as a Muslim community, we need to be really transparent in terms of 
um, our concerns as equal citizens in any country, Sweden, the UK, Austria, whatever country we're in, we have equal concerns, we have concerns that are equally legitimate to any other citizen in, uh, of the country that we live in. And that is what politics is. Mm -hmm. It's the discourse of sharing concerns, working together to alleviate those concerns in the way that works best for everyone. It is those like the far right and, and others, elites, etc., who try to create a marginalize, scapegoat minorities for the sake of creating a uh, cr creating a utopia for themselves um, at the expense of those uh, minorities right. and so on. Okay, Farid, let me ask you uh, about a point that you raised uh, earlier. You've said that there are laws against denying the Holocaust in more than a dozen European countries, but not the same kind of protection for burning a Quran. Why do you think that is? And does the Holocaust have a, Holocaust denial have a different sort of acceptable justification that Rasmus Paludan's action doesn't have? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think this is one of the problems that we are really facing when you speak about um, Islamophobia. I mean, Islamophobia is, on the one hand, uh, in, in terms of the history of Europe, just the other uh, side of the coin of, uh, of anti-Semitism. Um, you know, the, the whole history of anti-Semitism started really with uh, uh, excluding not only the figure of the Jew, but always the figure of the Muslim. Uh, if we speak about 1492 and the uh, Reconquista of, of Spain, um, up until our days today, I mean, in the, you know, I don't want to do a history lecture here, but uh, at the concentration camps, we really had this idea, you know, the, the Nazi perpetrators were calling those most humiliated Jews on the, uh, sitting on the ground, the Muslim, the Muslim, right? So there is a long intertwined and tangled history here. And I think, um, you know, what a lot of uh, political leaders unfortunately only have learned from after the Holocaust is don't do that with uh, Jews again. But the larger, the, the larger lecture was, the larger idea was not taken by, in, in terms of uh, we should really not uh, exclude any kind of minority based on religion, race or whatever. And, you know, um, coming may maybe back again to, the, to uh, the, the Swedish context, I mean, we now have a center-right party in power that is backed by a far-right party. But even those in the center-right, the way they have been uh, in, in, in the recent past, in the very recent past, the way they have been dealing with Muslim issues is very uh, worrisome. I mean, just to give you like one example, because again, uh, this guy, Paludan, he, he did... Uh, these Quran burnings like several times in the past. And last year, when there was also a huge debate about it, and then you had violent uh, counter riots, uh, what happened was like the current uh, uh, deputy prime minister from a very tiny uh, uh, um, center-right party, the Christian Democratic Party, uh, she said, well, the police should shoot those Islamists. That's how she called them, you know? Mm. And if, if, you, if you just understand that this is the context in which this is happening, um, it tells you, well, uh, we are not even think, uh, you know, we are not even talking about, like, should we um, uh, protect Muslims as we protect Jews? The debate is a wholly different one. It's like, <laughs> the police should shoot them, you know? That shows us just, like, how normalized these uh, very ultra-far-right uh, political positions have become and have really been co-opted by what we would call, okay. you know, nominally at least speaking, uh, mainstream center-right yeah. political parties. Ajmal, let me ask you, what kind of political action at this point against Sweden would you feel is, is justified? Well, firstly, we need to demand not just Sweden, but across Europe that Muslim communities should not be othered, should not be marginalized, should be treated as equal, given complete and um, equal right like everybody else does. Muslim communities should demand that across the board. Turkey can take any action it wants because it's been done in front of its own embassy and it's Turkey's own um, prerogative as to what they do. But as far as I'm concerned, as far as I'm concerned, if the entire Swedish nation was to come together and burn down all the Quran, it will not end this discussion. It's not about the Quran. It's about hatred of the other, hatred of the migrants. It's the white supremacist, racist ideology that lurks just under the surface in many European quarters today. You know mm. what? There is a dangerous streak in Europe that every now and again, the ugly head of this racist, xenophobic, 
far right racist mantra comes up. It didn't come. It, didn't, it wasn't that long ago that led to a concentration camp of Jewish people. And I believe and I fear if we don't deal with it decisively, nationally, locally, and internationally, condemn such behaviour, demand that this should be brought to an immediate end. There could be a, an awful massacre of some of the minorities in some of these European countries. And I would never want to see that in, in my lifetime, ever, ever, of mm. course. And we need to stand together united. It is not about the Muslims. It's about humanity. It's about us. It's about civilized people. And civilized people don't treat each other like this. Civilized people don't burn books. They discuss. And even if they disagree, they agree to disagree and live and let live. Burning book is a, a symbol of destruction of a people. And unfortunately, those people are Muslims in Europe today. Right. Ahmed, uh, let me ask you, because some have been complaining about journalists, the media, and international channels, even, even our show right now, giving this man far too much attention and actually legitimizing what he has been able to do uh, when, in reality, he only had 100 or so people turn out uh, to this, this rally he had. But then there are others that say, no, it's this exact attention that this issue needs. Where do you stand? Do you think we're setting off a chain reaction that emboldens people like Rasmus Paludan, or does this need the attention it, it is getting now? And that more. is a very good question. That is a very good question. Um, and the question perhaps could be shifted away from Rasmus and more towards, it, does Islamophobia exist in Sweden and other European countries and why? And so long as the, the narrative and the discourse is not hijacked onto the terms of you know right wing Islamophobes who want to who need who need attention and crave attention in order to give any kind of legitimacy to their short sighted point of view. Um, so long as we maintain the 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 narrative, the discourse around uh, really unpacking why does Islamophobia exist? You know, as the as the other two guests have said, you know there has there is a long tradition of otherization of uh, non Christians in Europe. And you know, right now, because of the co the context of the refugee crisis and the movement of many non-white people into Europe, you know, th this has given uh, the right-wing parties and individuals an easy way to get that conversation going again. Europe just has a long-standing tradition, almost a built-in knee-jerk reaction, really, of otherizing the the world. Um, you know, it was just quite recently, within the past half a year, I think, um, the EU head of foreign policy, um, his name, exact name escapes me right now, but he compared the EU to a garden and the rest of the world to a jungle. And what the EU members need to do is to go out and get what's good from the jungle, but return it back to the garden. And, you know, this is a senior, senior diplomat, um, politician, political figure in the EU. And uh, even though he apologized and tried to clarify what he said afterwards, um, the, 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 the sentiment remains. Mm. And it really is a, a sentiment which is the only way to really understand the lens through which Europe sees the world. It sees the world as a, a continual kind of uh, a, a world that is trying to encroach and attack Europe when history shows that Europe has only ever benefited and enriched okay. from its interaction with the world. Farid, we just have two and a half minutes left. I want to give you both final thoughts, so, so go ahead. Yeah, I think um, your, your question is, I think, very fair and um, has to be considered, and I fully agree with what just has been said. And we'll just uh, like add one more thing. Um, Sweden currently, and that this is, has not started with the far right coming to power or the center right, but Sweden in the last few years has shifted tremendously in the wrong direction in terms of institutionalized Islamophobia, of excluding Muslim civil society actors from the political landscape by calling them uh, uh, Islamists or, uh, or the, these kinds of, of, of different notions in order not to have them give, give them a, a place in, in, in the public space. And that is the problem that underlines, I think, a lot of what we are just discussing here on the surface. Okay. Ajmal, go ahead. Very simply, it's, uh, the, we have seen the end of colonization a long time ago. Somewhat, it is ironic that Europe is still living with the nostalgia of, they still think they're colonizing the world. Well, Europe, wake up and smell the coffee. You're not the colonial masters, and you're not the rulers of the world. Every human being on this earth is the same. 
is equal. For as long as this uh, supremacist colonial mentality remains in Europe, we will see more and more awful consequences of some of the far right politicians, as well as media colluding together to create this uh, environment of hatred and uh, intolerance. I stand for one simple thing. I'm a human, we're all human, we're all equal. And I need to be respected like that. I need to be treated like that. I'm a European. Never doubt my Europeanness and never push away Islam from the mainstream discussion table in Europe because Islam has a direct stake in making shaping of Europe today and tomorrow. Okay. Ajmal Masroor, that will have to be the final word. I'd like to thank you and Ahmed Hussein, as well as Farid Hafez, so much for being with us on this edition of the Newsmakers. That's unfortunately all the time we have. So I'd like to thank our viewers, of course, for being with us as well. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.